Master. You might as well take my name from up there. Coronation Street has been home to over 415 residents over the past 40 odd years. And there's one family in particular who've really stamped their mark on those infamous cobbles. The Duckworths. When you think Coronation Street, you think Jack and Vera. They're icons of ITV. For over 26 years, they've enjoyed calorific fry-ups. Why has he got two sausages? Countless booze-ups. Come on, we're missing good booze in time. And more than their fair share of balmy bus-stops. But whatever Weatherfield has to throw at them, it's like water off a Duckworth's back. You name it, we've done it. Whether they're enjoying a run of good luck or a running with the locals or even finding themselves running the Rovers, you just can't keep those Duckworths down. So join us as we turn the pages of the Duckworth family album. Oh, the Duckworth family album would be about that thick. Let's just hope we can fit it all in. Between them, Jack and Vera have appeared in over 2,000 episodes. That's over 1,000 hours of television. Trust me, I did the maths. So you could be forgiven for thinking that the Duckworth Dream Team have always been an item. You have no imagination, you. Jack and Vera is like one name. But you'd be wrong. Back in 1974, Vera's only other half was her bubble perm. It was really funny when I first met Bill. Uh, he was going to play Jack. Because I'd referred to Jack for about five years. We might have only heard about Jack in 1974, but some viewers might have caught a glimpse of the actor who would go on to play him. I'll let you into a secret. Bill Tarmy was an extra on Coronation Street. And if you look really, really closely, you'll see him playing darts. Ah! Oh! Ah! God, mate, I'm sorry. It would be five long years before Vera would finally introduce us to her Jack in 1979. When Brian and Gail got married. That was the first time Jack was actually seen. Hey, I met my husband, have you, Jack? Jack is the damn rovers, you know. Who did you say he was? Her husband. And in true Duckworth style, their very first scene together was almost a flaming disaster. Marriage. It was in a church, very, very cold day. And they used to wheel these gas fires round. Uh, and Liz was stood at the gas fire. My skirt had started to shrivel. I mean, it could have gone in, up into flames any minute. And I turned around and started smacking a bum. And I thought, this is a bit weird, this. And I was putting it out because it was about to go into flames. No, they may not be the hottest couple in Corrie, certainly not by today's standards, but they certainly warmed our hearts, and in 1983, they became a permanent fixture in our living rooms when they moved into number nine, Coronation Street. Come on. Yeah. aren't you going to carry her over the threshold? What, em? Um... It never carried us over at threshold when we got wed. It's not likely to start now, is it? Yeah, yeah, well, happen you're right. Probably have to make two journeys, any road. Well, mm. I wish you every happiness in your new home. And no home will be complete without the wow factor. Time for their son, Tasty Terry, to come home to roost. I suppose you've either got it or you've not, eh? Looking, he's fit, he's strong, he's masculine. Did you forget something? My senses, I think. But look beyond the beauty and soon you would see the beast. Well, Terry Duck was the ultimate bad boy. I think he was the bad boy before, before Coronation Street really had them. Terry was handy with his fists, even handier with his sticky fingers, and hands-on with all the other women. But even with those credentials, Vera still loved him. <laughs> Vera would never believe Jack that Terry was the person he was. I was going to say then. Don't you worry about But suddenly, in 1992, it looked like Terry the Terrible was beginning to turn as he found a good woman, made her a wife, and even produced a little Duckworth of his own. For once, it seemed that life was looking up. Well, apart from Terry being sent down for GBH and Lisa being knocked down in a road accident. Apart from that, life was great. And in 1992, with little Tommy in their lives and Terry due out of prison in time for Christmas, things were looking positively rosy. How is he, Terry? He's all right, keeping his nose clean. 
In fact, I think he's open to be out for now. Christmas. Oh, that would be nice. But a merry little Christmas wasn't on Terry's wish list, and with his release date looming, Lisa's father made an offer no double-crossing scumbag lowlife could refuse. But a lot of money. An agreed amount to be paid every year till Tom is 18. Given the choice between his bundle of joy and a bundle of cash, there was really no contest. As far as Terry was concerned, selling him to his in-laws, who lived in this nice, middle-class suburban house on the outskirts of Blackpool, as opposed to grimy Weatherfield, made total sense. And the fact that he could get paid 10 grand for it at the same time, you know, I rest my case. Where's the money? It's there. Don't you worry. You keep telling me it's there, but I haven't seen it yet. And we haven't got little Tommy yet. What made it worse for Jack and Vera, it, it was over Christmas. And Vera, bless her, had gone out and got him toys, and they were there under the Christmas tree. Oh. And whilst Vera was busy wrapping gifts for under the Christmas tree, Terry delivered his special gift to Lisa's mum and dad. I think selling the baby is just, like, outrageous, isn't it? Oh, Terry, I was just beginning to... Mum, listen to me. Vera? Jack! And he was absolutely disgusted with his son, so therefore he was no longer his son. And after years of take, 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 it was time for Jack to give Terry something he didn't want. I've seen you take what you want! I've watched your damaged folk and never give a damn! And you're trying to tell me that you were doing all this for somebody else's benefit? Well, I hope the lie chokes you. Oh! <laughs> And I can imagine that champagne corks were popped around millions of homes in the country when that happened, because everybody wanted to do it. <laughs> that punch was for everybody. It was a Christmas present to the nation. Terry, I'm begging you, stop this now, please. Yeah. I don't care about the money. Keep the money. No, I just want it back. I mean, poor Vera. Her grandchild's been taken away from her. She's got no grandchildren around now, and, and that's her dearest wish. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, it would be like having her heart ripped out of her, really. <laughs> After the traumas that Terry bestows upon his parents, it's nice to see that from time to time they do find some good fortune falls into the palm of their hands. You're heading for unprecedented good fortune. Two hundred pounds. Ah! Oh, it's me! Oh, it's me! Hey, we won a flaming fortune. <laughs> hey, won. One thousand nine hundred and forty-seven quid. Yes. <laughs> Lady Luck has bought the duck with a windfall totaling over one hundred thousand pounds. You wouldn't think so, looking at that wallpaper. They are incredibly lucky, you know. Um, <laughs> But uh, a fool and his money are always parted, aren't they? Right, so, how much right, love? 20,000? Who do I make it out to? Uh, Richard Hillman. You just know the minute they get it, <laughs> it's going to be taken from them. But the Duckworths aren't always daft with the dough, as a surprise inheritance in 1995 would prove. Only 30,000 quid! Oh, ah! ah! They are my little hey? swamp duck, did I always say? One day, the Duckworth ship will come home. Yeah. With 30 grand to play with, the Duckworth moves from terrace house to public house. Liz came to me one day and said, Hey, kid, we're going to be the landlord and landlady. I said, of the Rovers. I said, I've been in there bloody 13 years. I'm just trying to get out. Now we're going to be the landlady and landlord. Oh, my God. And that November, Jack and Vera became the fourth landlord and landlady of the most famous pub in Great Britain. Oh, Oh, Jack, I never thought it'd happen. There was always going to be trouble ahead. I'm doing things my way. Have you, have you got that glass tipped? <laughs> I'll give you a choice. If I'd have known what I were letting myself in for. When uh, Jack and Vera were in the pub, they thought that it was just like working in a tough If that true. Yeah, love it. Put us a little scotch in there while you do it now. Thank you very much. They would drink all the profits. I'm just... Checking this optic. And they've been like dipping into the into the till. Hey, hey, get up, get up, get up. <gasps> what are you doing? I'm telling you, you're doing it and you don't even know you're doing it. With the Duckworths out of control, what would the First Lady of the Rovers have thought about their unusual managerial methods? Somehow, completely. What's the word? Uncles.
I think when they do get a bit of good luck, whether it's winning money or getting the Rovers, I think the, the expectancy for the audience is, when is it all going to go wrong? It would be two years into their reign at the Rovers that events would conspire against them and their forecasts look weak. As of now, you owe customs and excise the sum of £17,650. Desperate to raise some dosh, Jack sold half of the business to Alec Gilroy and with one simple handshake, the Duckworth's fate was sealed. The end was nigh as, as regards the Duckwoods owning the pub when Alec Gilroy, the, of course, snake in the grass, came in. £30,000. Thanks, Alec. <laughs> so, in 1998, Jack and Vera decided to cut their losses and sell their last half of the Rovers to Alec. To the future. To the future. He felt that the Rovers was his rightful home, and the sooner they were gone, the better. On hearing his plans to evict them from their home, Jack and Vera became sitting duckworths. They barricaded themselves in the, the bedroom. From now on, no more Mr Nice Guy. Alec Gilroy was the real villain of the piece. Everybody hated him, and, um, and everybody showed their love and support for the duckworths. So it really was the people against Alec. Bacon and eggs to be going on with oh, Jack. Spider, you are a gentleman, son. Hang on. Tired of the Duckworth's ice cold Alec threw in the towel and admitted defeat. Then when they came down, the pub had been sold and, and somebody else had it. Hey, hang on a minute. Any questions, speak to your new boss. What new boss? You! I have a clatter when we left. Not only that, the floor drew my feet. I said, I can't go. <laughs> It's like concrete. Where are we going now? What do you mean, where we're going now? What I say, where are we going? So it was last orders for the Duckworths behind the bar of the Rovers, and they were back to square one, all packed up, no place to go. Good, good. Right, I'm off. If you were to line up all the scripts Liz Dawn and Bill Tarmy have had to learn over the past 30 years as Jack and Vera, then, frankly, you have too much time on your hands. I've seen more work in a signal. But it's safe to say that over three decades of appearances, the Duckworths have had more lines to remember than Betty's made hot pots. Bill and Liz have obviously been doing Coronation Street for years now, and the more and more the years have gone on, the more and more episodes we do. We now do five a week, so learning lines, you know, becomes a very difficult thing to do. Right, young fella. So how have they managed to do it? Oh, eat your cornflakes, yo. This is adult talk. We used to do things like put lines on the cornflakes box. Liz would have one in... In the sugar bowl. And Bill had a line on his cigarette packet. Nigel gets the cornflakes and then he moves my sugar basin. All of a sudden a big hand had come down and you think, what's going on here, you know? And you'd realise that that sugar bowl you just picked up has got half a script in it. Oh, oh God, so what am I working with here? I were in such shock, I picked Bill's cigarette packet up. <laughs> so now none of us knew what we were doing. No matter what the scene, no matter where it's set, their ingenious way of remembering Duckworth dialogue was foolproof. Or was it? Bill always has a good one of he'll take a bar mat out of, um, out of the Rovers and he'll peel it so he can write his lines on the bar mat and put it down. So I'll turn it over. Oh, well, if Bill comes in and it's turned over, I'll move, that's it. He just goes mad. I do it all the time, he just to wind him up. But remembering the lines isn't the only problem. Even remembering what you do when you're a duck with is a bit of a chore. Oh, I've done all sorts, you know, the uh, cab driver, window cleaner, barman, bar seller. We tend to think of Jack as being bone idle, which I think intrinsically he is. However, he has had jobs over the years. He was cellar man at the Rovers, he'd been a pool bearer, and he was a window cleaner. And when he did turn his hand to window cleaning, we saw a totally different side to Jack the lad. But your fingers in there dropping off. I mean, fingers are the least of my worries, darling. They were always chatting women up. Dulcie Froggett was one customer who certainly liked the way Jack squeezed his chamois. Do the insides on a discount, plus the George Formby impression. You do a good job up there, and we'll see. Like but Jack wasn't the only one dipping his rag in Dulcie's mop bucket. Why don't you uh, come inside and give us a proper look at your merchandise? And, of course, Jack tells him, and he is disgusted. You've been dirty, swine. Oh, I mean, you don't mean I've been oh, given the same... This was one episode of Confessions of a Window Cleaner Terry really didn't want to hear. <laughs> what a lucky lady she was.
<laughs> yes, Jack and Terry might have found some common ground with a common housewife, but since Terry acted more like the son of Satan than the son of theirs, Jack and Vera soon started opening their door to anyone who needed a place to stay. In total, they've had seven dropouts dropping in for a pot of tea and some TLC. One of the great things about the Duckworth is the door's near enough always open. Yeah. Back door, okay, go shift your stuff in. They are unofficial foster parents. Do you fancy moving in, you and Monica? Of course I would! <laughs> it sort of gave them a new lease of life when Tyrone came into it, Sean. It was the three of them together. Hey, he's got more beans than me, and he's got a ducky egg. Well, he's entitled, he's the lodger. Oh, so now I come second to the lodger, do I? No, you come third, the dog comes before you. I think Tyrone is the one that, if she could adopt, she would. I'm gonna have to go. Don't do the pots, Vera. I'll do them when I get back in, all right? All right. See you later. Well, that's wrong. You're a little bell to love. Oh, he's a good lad, isn't he? Puts me in mind of our Terry when he was that age. Vera, our Terry never were a good lad. Vera took him under her wing, and of course, then Jack. He was like his long lost son, wasn't he? He was a placement for Terry, what Terry should have been. There it is! Mr. J. Duckworth, that's you, that is. Make me the help us as I live and breathe. You are not wrong. <laughs> We've won the crossword, 50 big ones. I'd love to be called Tyrone Sylvester Duckworth. <laughs> Ta-da! Happy anniversary, Mrs. D. Oh, the oh. lovely. With uh, Tyrone, it's kind of a thing of trying to mould him in a way that they couldn't with Terry and having a sort of a second shot at moulding a son, you know. But one thing, you know, blood's always thicker than water. Blood might be thicker than water, but that didn't stop good-for-nothing Terry from bleeding his parents dry, as he would prove in December 2000. Terry's love child had developed this kidney disease, and they needed a compatible donor. You'll be the kiddie's best chance. So I get to be the hero for a change, eh? I if you like. He's precious. Terry's help would come at a price. On the surface of it, Terry has got no kind of uh, scruples or morals. But if I'm going to let some butcher cut me open, then I want, uh, hmm, at least 25 grand. Once the cash was in his account, Terry withdrew his offer of help and did a runner. And since Vera was the only other match, she made a life-threatening decision to offer her kidney instead. There's no wrong, is it? No, just... Well, I just think it's best if Doctor takes a look at her. This would mark Coronation Street's 40th birthday, and just as it did when the show first started in 1960, the episode transmitted live. You'll only hold things up if you don't. Liz just had the best part in that live episode because she just slept through it. And she just kept saying, you know, we're all learning our lines and really scared and worried and everything. She was like, yeah, I just get to lie there. Over 16 million people tuned in to the heartbreaking scenes to see whether Vera would make it. Even tough nut Terry seemed to crack, but I bet he didn't take on any graves. I was very pleased and very proud to be part of that live episode, 40 years, celebrating 40 years. Fantastic. Part of television history. I know that I've been a miserable, selfish, lying coward, but you got to give me another chance. you got to. Backstage, there was another surprise well-wisher who wanted to be part of the 40-year celebrations. Prince Charles came into the set and Liz was lay there in bed with her. Hey, <laughs> can we rock me grapes? And he actually looked round to his equity and said, I'm only kidding. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Vera's chances of surviving the operation looked slim, and Jack was forced to face the possibility of a future without his wife. Jack without Vera would be like having fish without chips. Tom without Jerry. Betty without a hot pot. Laurel without Hardy. This was one Duckworth drama with a happy ending. Vera pulled through when she was reunited with her grandson, whose life she saved. Look here. Got my family and friends. Oh, it's been a perfect day. <sighs> the end of a perfect day for the perfect partnership. So you'd expect the Duckworths to be practically perfect when it comes to their passionate pastime. Jack! Uh, Does he look capable of five times an hour? <laughs> I'm not an expert. Well, neither is he. Well, if you were a real man... I think you'd best have a cup of tea and lie down. OK. But you can forget about the tea. After 48 <laughs> years of marriage, have the flames of passion dampened? 
Not if Vera the Vixen has her way. Vera's tried all sorts to get Jack into the bedroom. Yeah. It's a night she, she, she took her kit off and let it bother the step off. Are you ready then? Because I'm off. I've had to go. Oh. Come on then, what are you waiting for? It took me weeks to get over that. Weeks. Come in. I had to have another large brandy before I went up them stairs. She knows he can't perform. I think he's... I think he's had it, Jack. I don't think he could if he, if he tried. But when Jack has an appetite that needs satisfying, it's not usually for love. He wants his sauce over something hot and tasty. And I said, what about, you know, tonight? And he said, make, make me a pan of chips first. Can you believe that? All right, then. If you make us some chips first. <laughs> You're a right romantic swan, you are. <laughs> Who wrote that? A pan of chips? <laughs> As they've grown older together, Jack's always had his eye on other birds. Pigeons? I think there's three people in Jack and Vera's relationship. It's Jack, Vera and the pigeons. Get in there. I've been worried sick over you. Yes, and that stereo is chewed up, Matt Monroe. Get it? No, there's some good to come of it, hasn't it? Thankfully, after all the years they've been together, the feathered kind have never been able to come between Jack and his own little swamp duck. And they've always ended up singing from the same hymn sheet. There ain't a lady living in this land as a swamp for my dear old Dutch. <laughs> All good things must come to an end, so how would Coronation Street feel without two of its most popular residents? If the duck were to ever leave, Corey will never be the same. It'll be the end of an era. All the best for the future. Jack and Vera. Yeah, Jack, Jack and Vera! Vera. The duck would saw Jack and Vera, and, uh, and when they go, that line should end. Maybe they couldn't be another generation of Duckworths. Maybe it would be just more than the country could bear. You know, if I had my life to live over again, I'd, I'd still be you. The future for the Duckworths shouldn't change. It should go lurching from pillar to post, as it always has done. There are some things that you just can't imagine Coronation Street without. That's the Rovers' return, the Cobble Streets, and the Duckworths. Hey, you worked a blinder, our kid. A blinder.